Okay. Um, thank you for coming out on um, uh, a night which is not particularly good weather. And welcome to the first lecture meeting of the 2018-19 session of the Irish Astronomical Association. Before we start, a little bit of housekeeping. For those of you who haven't paid your subscription yet, subscriptions fell due on the 1st of September. Um, £20 for individuals, £25 for family, or you can pay in euro, um, in cash, uh, for an extra five. Uh, or sterling checks. Uh, I can bring them to uh, Pat or see myself uh, at the um, end of the meeting. Or you can post to me, and uh, my address is on there, uh, 15 Ben Bain Park, Paul Barntray, 57, BT 578BP, or you can pay via the IAA website at uh, irishastro.org.uk slash join. A few items of interest um, around the place. Next Thursday night, not this Thursday, but the first Thursday next week, there is a special screening of 2001 A Space Odyssey at the Odyssey Cinema, at Cinema in Belfast. Uh, I believe it's £12. It's a special screening, and there will be a live uh, question and answer session with Keir DeLay. Afterwards, Keir DeLay played Dave Bowman in the film. So, I've also put on the, um, the website there for the place to go to get tickets. Tickets, I believe, are £12. I don't know whether there are how many are available. I bought mine a long time ago. So, whoopsie daisy, I'll just go back. Not. World Space Week is the 4th to the 10th of October. I believe there are some events in Belfast. If you go follow the, um, uh, the link there, worldspaceweek.org, you should be able to find them. Next lecture in a fortnight's time is Luke Duroy of, from Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies and the title of his talk is The Dawn of Multimetric Messenger Astronomy. And I should uh, add at this point that I believe we have some spare program cards uh, which you can pick up at the end of the meeting if you didn't get one with your stardust. Observing at Delamont Country Park near Killyleigh, uh, the next sessions we have uh, scheduled are Friday the October the 5th or Saturday the 6th. Now the way this works is we pick the first day, if the, if the weather is good on the first day then uh, we use that. Uh, if the weather is not good we go on the next day on the Saturday and if both the Friday and the Saturday are off um, we go for the next week, so that'd be Friday the 12th or Saturday the 13th. Check on the forum at 6 p.m. or on the IAA web uh, uh, Facebook page to see if the observing is on or off at 6 p.m. on the day. And for those of you who don't know where Delamont is, there's a map with it, the pin on it. It's near, quite near Down Patrick. <laughs> The next um, item is that Paul's going to give us a little bit of a roundup about what's going on in the sky. So, Paul. Right, a um, few things to talk about going on in the sky, and I'll start with a sort of a customary look at the sun. And, um, and the sun, we are well into the solar minimum, and there is nothing visible on the sun at the moment. For some reason, part of my slide doesn't show up there, which is the bit that tells you all the... Uh, the details, but so I'll have to do this from uh, from memory. Let me just see if I can make that happen. This is different versions of PowerPoint and all that sort of stuff for me. Now it's gone. Um, I did have a little table there. Um, the general gist of which is we're not quite back to the 2009 situation where 71% um, of all the days had no sunspots. Um, we are now at the situation, however, where 56% of days so far this year um, have no sunspots, and that's actually increased from 44% when we last, uh, well, when I last discussed this um, with you on the 3rd of March. So we're, we're getting well into quite a deep minimum by the look of it. Um, however, this does not mean that there are no auroras, because there have been, um, and they happen for a slightly different reason. Um, rather than sunspot explosions and solar flares and so on, we get um, 
coronal holes. And there is sort of one in progress at the moment. This is one here. And that's an area of the sun where um, the magnetic field becomes weak and um, uh, solar particles uh, start to, solar wind starts to spew out of there. Um, and if we're lucky, it comes towards Earth um, and gets into the atmosphere and creates effects like this. Now, this was actually taken on the 3rd of September in Lapland. So uh, um, there are auroras, um, just not as, as frequent and vigorous as they have been, um, say, 2014, 2015. We had some very good displays, um, but they are still there. And it, is, it is worth just keeping an eye on things. Um, one of the best sources of information, if I say so myself, because I put it together, um, <laughs> it's just a, just a page on our, on our website. It's uh, um, irishastro.org, and then there's a, a menu along the top. And there's one there that says Aurora, and it leads to this page, and it gives you some, some sky conditions. Um, this, this scrolls down a lot further than that. And it tells you uh, all, the, all the latest information that just it pulls from various places and puts into a digestible form. And really the thing that you're looking for um, is for the planetary K index to be reasonably well raised, above 4, um, but also for the polarity of the magnetic field. Now, how do you know that? Um, there's a straightforward number called BZ, and you don't really need to know what that is, it just, it's called BZ, and if that number is negative, the magnetic field is pointed south, and basically here, in this part of the world, we stand a chance of seeing the aurora. If BZ is north, then um, it, 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 it doesn't work properly. Um, so it's not really necessarily worth going out in those situations unless you get good information to the contrary. So um, that's the aurora, so that's, that's all happening. We have a comet in the sky, um, and um, I forget the rest of it, 21P is a, is a good cop out there. <laughs> yeah, all right, okay. Um, I have that in the next slide, I think, actually, but... Um, this is sort of, it's, it's coming down lower in the sky, but it's actually down into, into Gemini now. It's gone past, um, past Capella and down past M35, and it's into Gemini, and I have a map of where you'd, you'd look for that. Now, I do have to warn you at this point, this is not a hail bop that you look up, and uh, there it is. It's, it's not like that at all. It's very difficult to see. Um, um, yeah, Jacobin is in a 21P, and... Um, so here we are, this is the 19th of September. So it's down here, um, M35 is about here, and it's been passed there. Um, so we're down towards Alhena, um, and headed down past Gemini, getting lower in the sky all the time. Um, it is magnitude about 7, or thereabouts, um, and it's not very big either. Um, it's quite a small comet, but uh, um, it's there to see. Um, have a look at that. You should be able to pick it up in binoculars, but being small, it won't necessarily look anything radically different from an ordinary star. Um, so you'll probably need um, a telescope to, and a camera to, to actually get, to, to, to get good pictures. The International Space Station is making a series of passes, um, actually from, um, from the 25th, 23rd, it starts, the sequence of passes. As usual with these cycles, the beginning ones aren't very good. Um, they're quite low down and disappear quite quickly. Um, then it goes through actually to the 8th of October, but the best uh, viewings are in the middle of that time. So, for example, if I were to pick one there, say, the 28th of September, um, there's one there that's at magnitude minus 3.2, so that would be pretty bright. The other thing you need to look at is this number here, um, 42 degrees is almost as high as it gets. It can get to 50 degrees in, in Belfast because the ISS orbit um, <coughs> is 51 and a half degrees inclined. Um, and the reason for that was to get Russian money, so you can see it in Moscow. Uh, and uh, it comes only as far north as London. So it's, you're always looking south from this part of the world. Um, so f that one there, 42 degrees. There's one, there's a 49 degrees on the 30th of September there. That's as high as it gets, so a couple of 50s down there. 50 is the highest it can get from Belfast. Um, and your luminosity here, minus 3.4, 3.4, 3 minus 3.2, um, almost as bright as Venus at its brightest, so pretty good. And actually, it can flare to more than that. It can, just for moments, be even brighter than Venus for short periods of time. So 
always well worth looking, um, looking out for the International Space Station. It travels across the sky, um, takes about five minutes or so. Um, if you're looking at an evening pass, these are all evening passes, it fades in gen gently because you're looking at the back of it where the front is, is sunlit. So it appears to, uh, to brighten gradually. And uh, when it's sort of overhead or actually beyond overhead, headed towards the east, southeast direction is when it's at its brightest, unless it then moves into the Earth's shadow. Some, some disappear at that point. They fade out as they go into the Earth's shadow. So that's the International Space Station. I'll show you a picture I took in the summer. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a picture of the moon. I went up to, I went up to Carn Lock to take that. It's, um, it's, it's, um, it starts life as 4K video. You're looking at about three seconds of 4K video there. Um, and I went to Carn Lock for a reason, um, that I knew that this would happen. It's, to, to get this, this is about a three or four mile wide corridor, but this is the International Space Station passing in front of the moon. Um, and each dot there represents one twenty-fifth of a second. Um, so you'd say you're looking at approximately three seconds worth of video there. And I actually got enough frames to get a reasonably good moon and even managed to get some colour out of it. Um, so that's, that's the moon. Um, the blue areas on the moon uh, indicate titanium generally and, uh, and the rusty looking areas indicate iron. And it also has Clavius, my favourite crater there. And Clavius, just to give you an idea of scale, is about the same size as Northern Ireland. So that is to say, if you took your car to the moon, it would take you a long time to get there, but you could drive across that crater in a couple of hours, because it's about 130, 140 miles. So there we are, that's the moon and the International Space Station. And I did ha have it annotated there, but it's not showing. Um, there's a website um, called transit-finder.com um, that tells you where to be to see these things. Um, you have to be you split-second timing, because... So you're looking, it's, it's less than a second to go across the moon there and the whole lot that you're looking at is about three seconds worth. So um, it, uh, it happens there. But I, I, I use a 4K video camera, which is just a Panasonic that happens to do that. Um, so that's the moon and the space station. A few things in the sky of, of, of interest. Um, planets. We have a couple of planets. Um, Venus is more or less set in the west now. Um, Jupiter is visible in the southwest in the evening. This is set for half past eight. It's now dark at half past eight, isn't it? How, how we've come on over the last couple of months. And, uh, um, and Mars and Saturn are quite easily visible in the south in the early evening, um, except they are pretty low. Um, they're sort of only about 10 or 12 degrees above the horizon, so um, that's, that's not very high. Uh, last night, the moon was kind of right there, um, and had, had it not been um, about to turn stormy, um, it might have made a nice photo. I, I did have a look, but unfortunately, uh, it wasn't going to happen. But Mars and Saturn, still looking quite good. If you want to take a nice picture of the Milky Way, then it's not a bad time of year to be doing it, because... If you look, this is, this is a bit later, I've set this for 22.30 in the evening, um, at which point Saturn is almost setting here. Uh, Mars is a little higher up. Um, but the Milky Way um, in the southwest rises almost vertically um, up through um, Deneb, Baltair, Vega's just there, you can't see it, Summer Triangle. Below that, there's a whole lot of Milky Way. It's uh, just about... Um, a good time to, to, to get a good photograph of that if you go to a very dark place. The moon is a little bit troublesome at the moment, but that will be gone in a, uh, in, a, in a few days or so. It'll be rising later, past full. But um, that's always good to, good to look at. Um, as we go through the year, it gets a bit harder to get, but that's doing okay. Now then, what else have we got? Um, Andy's been out taking photographs, um, and he has, in fact, got here Mars... Um, and Saturn. That's, uh, it's almost perfect how the sort of a bit of light cloud there has sort of obscured most of it, except the two brightest objects in the sky, which is, which is good. And this is, uh, this is Nendrum, isn't it, Andy? Andy somewhere at Nendrum, um, down, the, down off the uh, Strangford Lock direction. So that's uh, planets. And he also has a few other things to take. And there's M27, Messier 27 in Volpecula, right in the middle of the Summer Triangle. Um, and that, 
I think I, I don't know if my memory is playing tricks with me, but did I, I think I probably first saw that in the credits of the original series of Star Trek. Was it, was it one of those that uh, um, appears in that? But uh, it's a planetary nebula, so it's um, a star that's thrown off its atmosphere um, and uh, it's still lit to an extent, so it's a reflection nebula of sorts. Um, and that's M27. This is the crescent nebula in Cygnus. Um, again, similar sort of thing, planetary nebula thrown off its outer shell and is, is still lit up nicely. And the cocoon, which uh, is a nice one. I've never actually got a picture of that one myself. I must have a, have a go at it because that's, that's quite high up in the sky at the top end of Cygnus. Um, now almost, almost into the Serta in the direction of Cassiopeia in the Milky Way. And uh, so there we are. That's, that's great pictures. And that's all I have to say, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. The only thing I would have to add to that is that um, the last time, about four weeks ago, there was a sunspot that was at all significant. It actually had reverse polarity, so that's an indication that it's um, the, one of the first sunspots of any, any size from the next cycle, from cycle 25. So we're certainly approaching minimum. Now we go straight on to the main event of the evening. Dr. Frank Prendergast, Prendergast from the Dublin Institute of Technology is going to give us a talk on um, ancient astronomy um, from the Neolithic to Iron Age, three case studies in Irish archaeoastronomy. So, Frank.